Okay, um, so today is the day that we traditionally call Palm Sunday in uh, light of the fact that this is the day that Jesus enters in Jerusalem. He's riding a donkey and people are kind of laying these uh, branches out on the street for the donkey to pass on, and we'll kind of take a look at that in a moment. Uh, it really is a wonderful picture of Jesus being hailed as the king. Many people in Jerusalem are recognizing that here is the promised king. He's coming. We can, we can see him. We can, we can even hail him. Hosanna. There's a lot of joy as we'll take a look at the account in Matthew uh, that he gives to us. There's just, it's inundated with joy. Not just the adults, but we'll also see uh, right after that how he goes and cleanses the temple of the money changers. There's joy that the children are also expressing. Hosanna. It's a wonderful, beautiful picture. And we'll get into the imagery with the donkey in a few minutes. It's not by accident that Jesus chooses this way to ride into Jerusalem. But it does remind us of the humble service of our king toward us. And it reminds us that a good king is first and foremost a servant of the people. He's not to lord over the people in a domineering and authoritarian way, but he's first and foremost a servant of the people, and the people that he's seeking to lead. If you guys ever read Lord of the Rings or saw the movie Lord of the Rings, I'm a big uh, fantasy guy. I, I like to read fantasy books. And Lord of the Rings was my hook into that, right? With uh, high school, my parents were big uh, J.R.R. Tolkien fans. They still are. Uh, so I couldn't help but inherit the family bug for Tolkien and uh, all that world. And one of the things I was always fascinated about was the man named Aragorn. You guys know Aragorn. Uh, he's the king in hiding, right? He's the legitimate, rightful king of the greatest city of men called Gondor. But Gondor hadn't had a king in a long time. They didn't know where he was. And it was Aragorn. He is the rightful ruler, but he was out serving the people as what they call a ranger. A ranger is someone who goes and he kills these dark, evil bad guys. And he's trying to keep the people of Middle-earth safe, but they don't even know that he's doing that. He was doing it kind of in secret, kind of in hiding. And it wasn't until the fellowship gathers at Rivendell, and you've had that, that fellowship gathering together to think about what we're going to do with this ring, that Gandalf points out that there is a rightful king of Gondor, and it's Aragorn. And of course, we know Baromir says there is no king in Gondor. And then everyone kind of looks at Aragorn, and he's like, I'm actually the guy. And there's this tension that comes and that gets uh, kind of figured out later. But I love, I love that because I think that this is kind of what we see a little bit with Jesus. He's, he's the king. He's being hailed as a king, but they don't, he comes in a way that's not expected. Right? Aragorn reveals himself in a very unexpected way. Jesus is revealing himself in a very unexpected way, but a way that cannot be missed. It's undeniable. The way that he's entering into Jerusalem is the king, the Messiah that has been promised. And the big idea today as we take a look at Matthew 21 and begin to unpack it is that Jesus is the king who seeks out and saves and serves his people. That this is the king that we have in Jesus. He seeks them out and he serves them and he saves them. So just like Ezra and the reading of the word, let's go ahead and stand in honor of the reading of God's word. This is Matthew chapter 21, 1 through 11. I'll read it, declare it to be God's word. We'll thank him for it together as is our habit. Now when they drew near to Jerusalem and came to Bethphage, to the Mount of Olives, then Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go into the village in front of you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, you shall say, The Lord needs them, and he will send them at once. This took place to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet, saying, Say to the daughter of Zion, Behold, your king is coming to you, humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a beast of burden. The disciples went and did as Jesus directed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and put them on their cloaks, and, and he sat on them. Most of the crowd spread their cloaks on the road, and others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. And the crowd that went before him and that followed him were shouting, Hosanna to the Son of David! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord! Hosanna in the highest! And when he entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred up, saying, Who is this? And the crowd said, this is the prophet, Jesus, from Nazareth of Galilee. This is the word of the Lord. You may be seated. We're going to take a look at two aspects of the kingship of Jesus. 
the, the servant who brings joy and the king who deserves praise. The servant who brings joy and the king who deserves praise. And this, this year for our Holy Week, we kind of have to, I'd like to have themes. It's sometimes a little easier to uh, kind of dig into uh, the season as we have particular themes and lenses by which we view Holy Week. And, and this year it's the kingship of Christ. We're going to take a look at him first as our servant king. And then on Friday with the Good Friday or Black Friday service, we're going to see him as the suffering king. And then next Sunday with uh, Resurrection Sunday, the supreme king. But today we're going to see that the servant who brings joy. I once worked with a good friend of mine, uh, and we were both employees of uh, the university. We worked as student uh, workers for residential life, so we painted the dorms, kind of kept them up, you know, those kinds of things. And uh, he and I were both employees, and we had uh, a kind of a supervisor above, uh, above us who kind of made sure that we weren't just, you know, doing what college students do, kind of forget to do their work <laughs> and just kind of do weird whatever you're doing. But my friend was so diligent, and he was so fun, and he's such a good employee. And you could just see that he, as an employee, brought great joy to our supervisor. It was just, it was, a, it was a wonderful joy to be a part of this little team. And I think that when a good servant or a good employee will bring joy to their employer, and this is what Jesus does. He's a servant who brings joy in his train. And Jesus is one who uh, intentionally chooses a way to enter in Jerusalem that connects to this prophecy that the people have been waiting for so long. The prophecy is out of the book of Zechariah, chapter 9, verse 9. It says this, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. Righteous and having salvation is he. Humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. Now this is the fuller version of that very same prophecy in the Old Testament, Zechariah, chapter 9. And remember something about Zechariah. Zechariah prophesied at a time of Ezra and Nehemiah, which we're studying together as a church body, the book of Nehemiah. And he's prophesying about the coming king. Zechariah's prophecy is all about the coming king, the one who would come. The first half is about the one who's going to come in, in, a, in a humble way. He's going to bring righteousness, bring salvation. This call to rejoicing is anchored in the reality that the Messiah King is coming. And he is now here in Matthew 21. He is here and he has righteousness and bringing salvation. Jesus is the very righteousness of God made flesh. And he is going to bring redemption for his people. This is why the people are rejoicing with great joy. They see that here he is, the man who's been promised. Now remember, Zechariah prophesied at a time when God was still speaking to his people through prophets. But that comes to an end with Malachi. And it's the last of the Old Testament prophets, and there's about a 400-year uh, sort of, we call it gap of silence, where God isn't speaking through a prophet, but people had the scriptures. I think it was intentional by God to get people in the scriptures, reading it, soaking it in, holding on to it, holding on to it, holding on to it like we do today. So this is a very well-known prophecy. It's one that people have been holding on to. They could see it starting to actually come true now. This man, Jesus, is coming in a way that we had seen in God's word. The promised Messiah would come in this particular way. This is amazing. This call to rejoicing is all over the Bible, right? Philippians chapter 4, verse 4. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. It's all over the New Testament. And this is because joy is connected to the reality of God's personhood. Okay? Joy is is connected to the reality of God's personhood. Jo joy apart from God isn't joy. Now we might feel emotions of happiness. Those are certainly common uh, emotions, but that's not joy. Joy can elicit a feeling of happiness, but joy is something deeper, more profound, larger, more eternal, and infinite in its reality because it is connected to the person of God. C.S. Lewis, uh, the great... English philosopher and theologian says this, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit glorify each other. At the center of the universe, self-giving love is the dynamic currency of the Trinitarian life of God. The persons within God exalt, commune, and defer to one another. When early Greek Christians spoke of perichoresis, means the divine dance, in God, they meant that each divine person harbors the other at the center of his being 
In constant movement of overture and acceptance, each person envelops and encircles the others. I love this description of that relationship in the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Three persons in one being, one substance, the triune reality, the tri-personality of God. This love and joy in serving one another is the center of God's being and personhood. It is the center of the universe, the cosmos. So really, the call to joy, the expression of it, as we have here in Matthew 21, is not just anchored in some fleeting emotional experience that we have, but it's actually called to emulate the Trinitarian God that we love and serve, to put God at the center of our universe, to defer to him, accept him, and to enjoy him. And in this way, we can glorify him with our life and our love and our actions. And Jesus is also the embodiment of righteousness, the very righteousness of God made flesh. Remember Zechariah chapter 9. And he has visited us. Jesus, as the humble king, instead of demanding worship and honor, he's actually giving his life away to his people who will be saved. There's a humility that's here. I think humility is always very attractive, isn't it? You ever seen someone who's actually truly humble? There's something beautiful and winsome about that. That's on purpose. Again, it's emulation of God himself. We're called to joy, to rejoice in who Jesus is and what he's done for us. But the joy that the people are experiencing here is they're they're seeing prophecy beginning to be fulfilled in the coming of the Messiah King who's going to establish his eternal kingdom forever. He's the son of David, the one that God had promised to David that one from your throne would sit on the throne over all the nations, for all time. That's this guy. He's coming. His kingdom is being inaugurated here and now. Let's rejoice with this. But the people, I mean, they lived under Roman occupation. Their lives were very hard. This wasn't like ease of circumstances and lots of money and I'm feeling really secure and now I can have joy. But this joy is connected because they're receiving Jesus as the king. When we receive Jesus as the king in our lives, it does bring joy. It really does bring us and connect us to the divine joy in God. He is the servant who brings joy. But he's also the king that does deserve praise. And how do the people express this? Well, they're doing the best they can. What do you see what they're doing? They're taking the clothes off their back. Literally, they're everyday clothes. They're taking, this isn't like we're coming in our Sunday best right? And then, you know, we're going to lay it before Jesus. This is just, they're coming and like, oh man, here comes Jesus. I love this guy. Let's take off whatever I've got and honor him as best I can. Taking palm leaves down, like leaves from a tree. You guys ever cut palm tree leaves? It was one of the chores I had growing up. And we had those really spiky ones, right? So my hands would always get cut up every time I would cut these, these branches. So Maybe some of these people are actually bleeding for Jesus. I I don't know. I don't know what kind of palm trees they had there. But they're doing the best they can, and they're doing it joyfully. I think this is a good lesson for us that we don't need to dress ourselves up to come to God. We don't need to, like, figure out, like, oh, man, i got to get this thing right before I can bring it to God. He just wants us as we are now, this exact moment in time. Whoever you are, however you are, come to Jesus. He wants to receive you. He wants to to see you part of his eternal family. And they're looking to serve the Christ. I think that oftentimes serving other people gets us outside of ourselves, right? It gets us focused on the other person. That momentarily sort of brings us out of ourselves and allows us to actually kind of have a a sense of joy. I think it's really a gift of grace to serve other people. They also followed him. They went before him, and they followed him. But notice, he's not coming in on a war charger horse. Uh, We just went to uh, some friends of mine who got a ranch way out in the back country, and they've got these horses across the way. And we were feeding the little horses yesterday, and I was like, these things are huge beasts. Like, horses are not small. And there are small horses. I'm not saying, but these things are, these are big. And I was like, these are just like normal horses. Imagine that this was like bred for war. Those things are humongous. 
No wonder there's a lot of fear with a cavalry charge back in the medieval period. That thing would just bowl you over. This is not that. This is a donkey. And it's a young donkey. Never been ridden before. Never been used. So it's probably very slow. And I think it's interesting that Jesus chose a slow beast of burden to kind of set the pace for his victory march. Isn't that kind of interesting? He's not charging in, you know. He's slowly coming in, setting the pace. I know for me, I, I think my life tends to be really fast-paced, and so I was really challenged by letting Jesus kind of set the pace in my own life, you know, having to rush ahead or letting him set the pace in my life. People also shouted praise to Jesus. They blessed him. They proclaimed him to, the king, to be the king. I think there's something about singing, using our mouths to declare praise to God. I think there's something about that that can stir joy, that can stir a love and a fervor and a zeal in our souls. Consider Psalm 71. My lips will shout for joy when I sing praises to you. My soul also, which you have redeemed. Now, this particular passage in 21, 1 through 11 ends uh, with this question, asking, who is this man who is stirring up all of Jerusalem? Verse 10, when he entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred up, saying, who is this? Now, think about this. This is the last week before Jesus is crucified and then rises again from the dead. He had been ministering in and around Jerusalem for how many years up to this point? Three years. He was well known already as the son of Joseph, the son of a carpenter. <laughs> so this question, who is this? Are they really looking for more information? Like, ah, oh, who, who's this celebrity guy? I've never seen him before or heard about him in my life. This is not the question that's being asked. I believe that Kind of the divine veil has been pulled back just a little bit so that people got a glimpse of the eternal kingship of Christ as he's coming into Jerusalem. The word stir in the Greek that is being used here by Matthew means to be tremble, to quake in fear. The people, some here, are joyful at the Messiah's coming. He's coming, that means salvation is here. That means the kingdom is being inaugurated I want, a part, I, want a, I want a part of that. And others were afraid because they see that he's also a king who brings judgment, as a rightful king does, upon those who are disobedient. Who is this? We know there's three roles in the Old Testament that God's leaders held. One of a prophet, one of a priest, one of a king. Here, he's very self-consciously choosing a way to come in and saying, hey, I'm the king. Worship me. But also, he's declared himself to be the promised prophet, right? That's the very last question. Who is this? And their answer was, he's the prophet. Remember, Moses had received a promise from God. One day, one from among you, a prophet among you, would rise and would actually be the Lord himself. So they're saying, this is that prophet that God promised to Moses way back in the wilderness. Here he is. But he's also bringing atonement and salvation to his people as the priests would do for the people. So here, even in this passage, we see Jesus fulfilling those three roles of prophet and priest and king just in this little snapshot. It's a beautiful picture of Jesus. So what is Jesus doing? He's shaking, stirring things up. What is he stirring up? Well, obviously the status quo is being stirred up. He's coming in as declared king. Romans didn't like that, right? That's why they had Herod. He was a puppet king. He wasn't connected to the true kingly line of David. He was a usurper, but they saw a guy they could use and manipulate for their particular end, so they put this guy, Herod, as the puppet king of Israel. But he's the true king. Right? He is the one who's connected to that divinic kingly line. He is the true king. And Romans didn't take well to things getting shaken up like that. So there's going to be some kind of a fear of a political or military kind of reprisal, perhaps. I think at times, we as Christians, as we live in a post-Christian era, our allegiance to God, our allegiance to his word, to his values, might feel like a threat to the cultural status quo. It might feel like a threat to the new moral order. We might be seen as enemies, perhaps, 
of the culture, or of modern society. But the world has always hated Jesus. In fact, Jesus even says in John chapter 15, if the world hates you, know that it hated me before it hated you. If you're of the world, the world would love you as its own. But because you are not of the world, but it chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Friendship with the world is enmity toward God, is what Jesus is saying here. I think there's also kind of a stirring up, not just of the status quo. Jesus is setting himself down as the rightful king to be adored and worshipped and honored and served. But also there's a shaking up of worship that takes place and a restoration of human dignity. Jesus is the great shaker of our lives. Now, when he comes into the the city here, what's the first place that he stops at? We'll find that in the next section. Matthew chapter 12, 21, verses 12 through 16. So then Jesus entered the temple and drove out all who sold and bought in the temple. And he overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold pigeons. He said to them, it is written, my house shall be called a house of prayer, but you make it a den of robbers. And the blind and the lame came to him in the temple and he healed them. But when the chief priests and the scribes saw the wonderful things that he did, and the children crying out in the temple, Hosanna to the son of David, they were indignant. And they said to him, do you hear what these are saying? And Jesus said to them, yes. Have you never read out of the mouth of infants and nursing babies you have prepared praise? Jesus is quoting there an Old Testament prophecy again from the prophet Isaiah. In Isaiah chapter 56, we have this description of the temple. It says, on the foreigners, means those who are not part of the nation of Israel, who join themselves to the Lord, to minister to him, to love the name of the Lord, to be his servants, everyone who keeps the Sabbath and does not profane it and holds fast my covenant, these I will bring to my holy mountain and make them joyful in what? My house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and their sacrifices will be accepted on my altar, for my house shall be called a house of prayer for all peoples. And Jesus here is quoting this line as he comes to the temple, and he's cleansing the false worship. He's cleansing the money changers and those who are selling animals. He drives them out because they had been cluttering up the temple so that people couldn't pray. He's saying, hey, get out of the house of the Lord. He's saying, no, get out of whose house? My house. This is my house. People sometimes say, well, Jesus never claimed to be God. Well, this just proves it to be false. This is God. He's here. And he's not happy with people cluttering things up. The area where all these muddy changers and the the sellers of animals were at, that little section of the temple was where the Gentiles were supposed to come and worship Yahweh. God and his Benevolent, sovereign provision, not just for Israel, but for all the nations, desires, worship, and praise for all the nations. He set outside a particular area of the temple for the Gentile nations to come and to worship Yahweh, to pray to him, because he's the God not just of Israel, but of all nations. And this is the area that the money changers and the, the lenders had cluttered up. The Gentiles, the nations, couldn't come and worship God. He clears out worship. The Jews had fallen in love with the riches and the profits of the world. They desecrated their holy temple for just a few extra dollars. This would be a safe place for all nations to come and pray to God. This place was sacred to the Lord, yet man had corrupted it. This cleansing was a stinging rebuke to the racial pride and arrogance of the Jews who didn't seem to care or want others to worship God. I think this cleansing here ought to remind us No matter who we are, no matter where we come from, God desires to have us relate to him in prayer. He's welcoming us with open arms. There's, like these Israelites here, we have a lot of ways that we can clutter up our own hearts and our own lives with the stuff of the world, right, so that we're not actually communing with the Lord. Sometimes I think the Spirit needs to clean house, right, get rid of those things in my life, that's distracting me from my relationship with the Lord. It can be a painful process. I remember when uh, my, I was moving out of the house for college and my parents had a big giant box of my stuff and they said, we're cleaning house. So get rid of the stuff you want. Everything else is going in the trash. 
I appreciated that now because I, I know that having four kids, I know how easily you accumulate stuff. Uh, but at the time, I was like, oh, man, that kind of hurts a little bit, you know, like this is stuff I've collected over the 18 years of my life that you're just going to chuck in the garbage. I think the Spirit sometimes needs, needs to do that in our life. There's stuff that we just don't need in our life anymore. He wants to remove it so we can actually have a clear view of the Lord. We can relate to him in prayer. What else do we see? The people are accusing Jesus of receiving worship. Right? The children are saying, Hosanna. Right? The people in Matthew 21, 1 through 11 are saying, Hosanna. The children now are saying, Hosanna. And they were angry. They said, don't you hear what these people are saying to you? Don't you hear what these little kids are speaking to you? Aren't you going to stop them, Jesus? They said, well, have you... You read from the law, you who have, so you memorized the entire Old Testament. Haven't you heard what Jesus says? Out of the mouths of infants and nursing babies, you prepare praise. Jesus not only says, uh, no, I'm not going to stop them. He says, no, I am God. I'm the Lord. I'm the creator. And also, if you're not going to do this, you who know the law, you who have memorized the law, you know what? God has given this gift to children. God has given it to them from their mouths would come praise to the Lord. I love that, that picture with the kids. It's such simple trust, simple delight in the Father, just coming to him and enjoying his presence in a way that the Pharisees had just really cluttered it up, you know, overcomplicated things. It's one of the things that the Apostle Paul kind of had to unlearn in many ways, is how to actually truly relate to the Lord in simple trust and enjoyment of God. Jesus coming on a donkey would have reminded the people of the coming king who brings judgment against his enemies as well. This is why he's quoting from the prophet Zechariah. The first half of Zechariah is all about the coming of the humble Messiah king who brings salvation for his people. The second half of that prophecy, the second half of that book, is all about the judgment of the king. You get some of the most intense sort of visions and descriptions of the wrath of God in the second half of Zechariah. It's because it's the king who's coming to bring judgment to his people. Those who reject the king are going to be found under his judgment. In fact, Jesus even gives and declares the reason for his coming to earth in John chapter 3. I'll read this. He says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. That's very familiar to us, isn't it? Let's keep going. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. It's also nice. Let's keep going. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already, because he has not believed in the name of the only son of God. And this is the judgment. The light has come into the world, and people love the darkness rather than the light because their works are evil. For everyone who does wicked thing hates the light and does not come to the light. Let his works should be exposed. But whoever does what is true comes to the light, so that it may be clearly seen that his works have been carried out in God. We love that first verse, don't we? But we forget the rest of that stuff. We forget the rest. Jesus comes to redeem his elect, to show that he is, in fact, king. He's the Lord. He's Yahweh made flesh and deserves our praise, deserves our worship, deserves our life, deserves everything of ourselves in praise and honor and worship of him. And he does come humbly and meekly to redeem his people, riding on a beast of burden in order to show that he would be the one to bear the burden of his people's sins and the judgment on their behalf. At this time, he didn't come to bring the final judgment. His coming, however, did condemn all those who would reject him to the judgment of God Almighty. So like the people here, in the first 11 verses, we have a choice today. Will we acknowledge and honor and worship Jesus? Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Or will we quake in fear, knowing that the judgment of God Almighty hangs over your head today. I think that 
as people see the ways in which we respond in our life, responding in joy in our present circumstances, present circumstances, for those of us who are connected to the joy of the Lord, the joy of the Lord is our strength. Why? Because joy is the being of God. That really isn't going to be moved by present circumstances. That doesn't mean that present circumstances in our life are easy. Right? They could be really difficult, really frustrating, really stressful, or anxiety-inducing. And for those of us who are in the Lord, we have that joy that will never be removed. It is always there. I think we have a lot of opportunities in our culture today for the gospel to be seen and experienced and responded to in joy. And I think joy is one of the most powerful testimonies to the gospel. So today, this afternoon, may we rest in our King's Lordship in our lives. May we continue to give of ourselves to other people. And may we respond in joy to the love, the healing, and the hope of our Lord Jesus Christ. I'm going to finish with Mark chapter 10. Jesus says this, But whoever will be great among you must be your servant. And whoever will be first among you must be slave of all. For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Let's pray. Father, I thank you that in love you sent your Son to live the life that we could not live, a life of perfect worship, of perfect obedience, a perfect love and trust. And I thank you that you sent him to bear the burden of our sin and the burden of the punishment for our sin. And I thank you for raising him to new life, that for all who are found in him, the sin is gone. The hope of glory is ours, anchored in heaven where it can never be removed. Jesus, I thank you that in love for your Father and in love for us, you obediently came and you lived that life and you served your people. You continue to serve us now through your Holy Spirit. And Holy Spirit, I thank you that you are the one that exposes our sin and allows us to come freely to Jesus who forgives and cleanses and justifies us. Jesus, we thank you. We thank you for the deep love that you have. This love that will never be removed. This love that will carry us through all of the days of our life. The love that we'll continue to experience in ever-increasing measure even after our life here on this earth is completed. Jesus, I thank you. And we pray all of these things now in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let's go ahead and stand as we prepare to respond to God's word. Doing this first with our confession of sin. Just as we saw with the video, the people confess their sin to God, we will also confess our sin together. Let's go ahead and say this together. Heavenly Father and King Jesus, we come to you this afternoon as people who would rather govern our own lives than submit to your rule and shepherding care. Instead of bowing down in reverence, full of awe and wonder that you, the almighty creator, king of the universe, should stoop so low to love and care for us, we often treat you as a servant who should do our bidding and meet all our desires. Cause us to know and feel our King's great love for us until we are transformed into people who love others deeply because of a great sense of our own need and our own sense of our forgiveness and adoption. Open our lips to join the heavenly worship service and sing praises to our King today, tomorrow, and forevermore. Amen. And now, of course, this assurance of pardon that we have out of Psalm 138. Let's say this together. We give you thanks, O Lord, with our whole heart. Before the rulers of men, we sing your praise. We bow down toward your holy temple and give thanks to your name for your steadfast love and your faithfulness. For you have exalted above all things your name and your word. On the day we called, you answered us. Our strength of soul, you increased. We'll also do this by responding at the Lord's Supper here. We have a table over there, and we have a table here as well.
At the table, we experience the servant lordship of Christ. We take the bread and we're reminded of his body broken for us that we might be healed. In his wine, we dip it in the wine or the juice. His blood, where we are reminded of his willingness to bleed so that our consciences might be cleansed. Jesus did this out of his servant love and his kingly humility. May we take and eat and drink this afternoon to the glory of God this afternoon and seek to imitate his service in the world. So as all church, take some time to ponder these things and take the Lord's Supper when you're ready.